Simon's lecture series this semester. It's a great pleasure to introduce Jean Pierre Zemay, who will be giving lecture series. And the first lecture is titled Philomorphic Morse in Poetics and the Green Griffith Conjecture. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm very glad to be here and feel very honored to give uh, Jane Simon's uh, lectures on this week. Uh, so I will try to uh, explain uh, some basic results about uh, polymorphic mass inequalities and uh, applications to algebraic geometry, especially a recent result concerning uh, the green Griffiths conjecture, which is a conjecture about the behavior of polymorphic curves drawn in projective algebraic varieties of general types. So uh, let me start with uh, very basic uh, definitions. So uh, X throughout the talk will be a compact complex manifold. N as we mentioned. And uh, we consider L over X a polymorphic line bundle. Then, uh, of course, uh, you have a D-bar operator. Uh, you can use the D-bar operator to compute cohomology. So you, you look, for instance, at PQ forms, and you consider uh, HPQ, uh, XL, the PQ D-bar cohomology group. Uh, it's enough to consider P equal to zero, actually. Uh, it's well known uh, by using sheaf theory that this is the same as uh, the homogy to the coherent sheaf of sections of, of the line level M. Using, for instance, Chesh homology or whatever. Okay, so we, we are interested in uh, understanding uh, better uh, general properties of this, uh, especially the asymptotic homology. So uh, I will introduce the asymptotic homology groups. Or group dimensions, functions. So by definition, uh, I look at H hat Q, X, L, and this is the limb soup as uh, K goes to infinity of, uh, well, you renormalize by n factorial for some reason, divided by K to the n times the dimension of X into the case tensor power of L. So uh, here, uh, small h means just dimension. So uh, h, small h q of x L means dimension of, of those groups. OK, and now you, you want to understand uh, the asymptotics as k goes to infinity of, of, of the growth of the homology group. Of course, uh, if you uh, look at the Euler characteristic, uh, things become much simpler. So the Euler characteristic is just by definition the alternate sum of dimensions. And then uh, it is well known that if you look at uh, the case power here, And then you get a polynomial, which is a so-called Hilbert polynomial. And it can be computed by the Riemann-Hoff formula. Uh, so by Riemann-Hoff, uh, it's equal to the integral over x of uh, the 
Chern character, which in that case is just exponential k times c1 in L, multiplied, multiplied by the Todd class. <coughs> Tx you take uh, the n n part to integrate, and actually you get polynomials such that the leading term is uh, k to the n over n factorial times the first term class of L raised to power n plus lower order terms which can be computed in terms of the term classes of L and X. The drawback of, of this formula, although it is a very strong and very useful, is that it doesn't give any information on the individual homogeneous. You only have information on the determinant sum, which is definitely useful, but, but not complete information. Um, and therefore, you would like to, to, to do more. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, uh, there is an analog in the holomorphic case of the Morse inequality. So, here in the land of uh, John Miller, I will not explain to you that, uh, that uh, Morse inequalities are very useful. Uh, so, they are very useful in the, the differentiable category, but they are equally useful in the holomorphic category. So, uh, unfortunately, in the holomorphic category, uh, the holomorphic Morse inequalities hold true only asymptotically. You don't have, uh, in the real case, uh, you look at the Morse function, you look at the critical points, you look at the in indices of the critical points, and then uh, you know that the alternate sum of the Durham, uh, or the Betty numbers, well, let me denote them by HQ, they are HQ in the sense of Durham here, um, and then you have an inequality in terms of the number of critical points. So you look at the, the critical points of various indices, and then you have uh, such an inequality in terms of the number of critical points of any index. Uh, in the complex situation, um, you have uh, an analog, but uh, you don't have a concept of isolated critical points. So uh, this is replaced by something different, which is obtained by computing curvature. So let me recall the uh, concept of curvature, of course, it's well known to many of you. So uh, suppose you, you pick the Hermitian metric on L, which I will suppose to be smooth, and locally uh, you can trivialize the bundle. Sorry. You already used the line of little h. It's a different one. So. No uh, h, uh, yes, h and h, well, okay. as long as uh, there, are, there are no indices to that h. <laughs> uh, that, that is a difference. <laughs> okay. uh, but I will, I will not make you the, much of that. Okay, so locally, uh, you pick a point here, you, you identify a point uh, uh, to, to a complex number, and then uh, the metric. It's just uh, defined uh, as a, a corresponding complex number multiplied by some weight, which is convenient to write as exponential minus p. And then uh, you can uh, define, you can take this as a definition, although uh, it's better to use a connection, of course, but I'll not explain that. You, you, you take uh, i over 2 pi times dd bar of, of the weight phi here. And this does not depend on the choice of the trivialization and gives a 1 1 form, which is a real 1 1 form. It's of type 1 1. And then uh, the chunk class uh, is just uh, the, the cohomology class of uh, this form, of type 1. C1 of L. can be taken to be just the cohomology class of uh, curvature form for any choice of the Hermitian metric. Okay. Um, now I, 
uh, introduce the analog of the uh, Morse sums, the Morse intervals. Uh, so the Q's Morse integral is the integral over a set which I will denote by L H Q of the curvature form raised to maximum power n with correct sign. And here, so you look at x, uh, you look at any point x at the signature of the curvature form at point x. So you suddenly have a set where uh, one of the eigenvalues is zero. So you have the uh, here this is a set where it determines zero, so this is degenerate. And then you have some kind of chambers uh, where you have a uh, signature, uh, so n positive eigenvalues, so this is index zero, index one, index two, etc., index q. So index q, I mean uh, n minus q positive eigenvalues and Q negative eigenvalues. So, uh, in contrast with the real case, uh, these are open sets, which are real analytic, if you take a real analytic matrix, say, smooth. Uh, if it's smooth, then it's just uh, random open sets. Okay? And then, uh, you have to in introduce the analog of the Moss uh, partial sums here. So you introduce what I will denote by H hat. So it's the asymptotic cohomology. But now uh, you take the rim soup as k to infinity of n factorial over k to the n times the alternate sum of uh, double d bar community groups. And then the, the theorem is as follows. So this is the, the main result which I got uh, really long ago, in 1985. Uh, that this uh, synthetic cohomology is controlled for any smooth Hermitian structure on air, uh, the asymptotic homology is controlled by, uh, by the Morse interval. But then uh, you should take the alternate sum. Of course, you should take uh, IQ minus IQ minus 1. which is the same as the integral over a set which I will denote by x l h at most q which means that you take the union of the chambers where you have index 0, 1, etc. up to q. So this is the basic theorem. Um, let me. So, in case uh, you have q equal to dimension, um, this uh, is the complete sum, so it's the Euler characteristic. And then what you get uh, is uh, the integral over the whole of x, because of course the integral on the degenerate part is zero. So, it's the complete integral, so it's uh, up to the sign, it's the, uh, it's the leading coefficient of the Hilbert polynomial. 
And the normalization by n factorial is just to compensate uh, uh, here, it's just the inverse of this uh, growth. Uh, here, uh, in, in this way, uh, you don't have lower order terms. Uh, if you if you go back to the uh, uh, um, Comoge groups, it means that you have uh, an error term which is negligible uh, with respect to k to the n. So you have lower order, although you don't know as precisely as in, in the Hilbert polynomial that this would be a gross k to the n minus. Uh, depending on, on the behavior of the curvature, it could be worse. I mean, depending how you have the generations here, it's rather subtle. Okay, so let, let me give you a hint of how this is proved. Uh, although uh, the details are uh, not so short. So it's some kind of, of uh, variation of the uh, tia bot faculty method. So, so you have a localization procedure. And also, you combine this with uh, Edward Witten's technique for proving the ordinary uh, mass inequalities by uh, some heat uh, kernel technique. So let me give you just a few ideas. So the uh, basic thing is to introduce, of course, the... Sorry? How, how should we think about this big soup? Does it could be negative or it could, it could, it could have something that is the soup and most of the action takes place in Already, uh, from the definition, it's not completely clear that the limb soup would be finite. Of course, the theorem tells you that this limb soup is finite because it's, it's controlled by uh, something which is uh, computable by curvature. Uh, and uh, you can show that uh, the limb soup cannot be minus infinity. Mean, uh, you, you can show that the, the limb soup is over the real number. Well, one, one of the difficulties is we, we still don't know at this point in, in any dimension that the limb soup is actually limit. Uh, the expectation is that all terms here have limits. That the, the limb soup is actually a limit and uh, that each individual term the sum has a limit. But this is hard. This is one of the conjectures. Okay. I will come to this. So, idea of proof. So you, you look at L to the power K, and uh, uh, you put, of course, uh, as a metric, uh, the K tensor power given emission metric. And then you compute uh, the complex uh, Laplace operator, which is uh, D bar, but D bar I will denote by d bar k here, it's the d bar acting on, on this bundle. Uh, as usual, you, you take d bar d bar star plus d bar star d bar. And then it's well known that cohomology is given by the harmonic form, so by the zero eigenvalue of this. I don't assume, no, we don't want to care. Don't care. Any, any compact compass manifold? Um, oh, yes. Uh, I agree that you, you have to compute uh, the dual. So here you, you take, take an auxiliary uh, emission structure on, on, on X to, uh, to compute the, the adjoint here. You need that. Take auxiliary emission metric, but you don't need care. This is a metric of Tx, the tangent bundle. Okay, so you compute the adjoint, and then you look at the harmonic sections, and of course uh, you, you have that uh, H, HQ of x into L by Hodge theory is isomorphic to the harmonic forms for this Laplace uh, operator with values uh, in L to the k. And now you use a Witten's idea. Uh, 
so the idea used by Witten is to replace uh, computational homology with infinite dimensional spaces by finite dimensional spaces. And these finite dimensional spaces uh, are precisely uh, eigenspaces of the, of the Laplace operator. So you look, let me introduce E, Q, lambda. This is the sum, or maybe at most lambda. This is the sum of eigenspaces. It's an elliptic operator, so the, the eigenspaces are finite dimensional. So you look, you look at the sum of eigenspaces of this Laplace operator. Uh, but you renormalize for some reason by one over k. I will explain later. With eigenvalues at most lambda. And then uh, it turns out that, of course, del bar commutes with the Laplace operator. Just by definition. And therefore, uh, this makes a complex of, of finite dimensional spaces because the eigenspaces are mapped by d bar on eigenspaces in degree uh, one more. So you get a complex. Again, given by the zero eigenvalue, by the harmonic forms. And of course, um, elementary application of linear algebra shows that uh, the alternate sum of homology groups is less than the alternate sum of dimensions of those finite dimensional spaces. So you only have to estimate the dimensions of those e to uh, most lambda. And it turns out that you can compute. So, discussion, okay? One can compute limit, and it's actually limit as k to tends to infinity of one over k to the n times the dimension of those things. Of course, it, it still depends on the k. Maybe I should put the k. Uh, so I will not give details, uh, neither I will give the formula, but I will tell you why uh, this is computable. This is very easy. Because uh, if you uh, compute the uh, L2 product, this is of course the norm of the bar square the d bar star square. And when, when you compute in coordinates, you have something like this. So you have derivatives and then you have the connection matrix. But the connection matrix get, gets multiplied by k. With, with some 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 with respect to the, the derivative. And then you have a curvature, but the curvature gets multiplied also by k. So you have some potential here plus k v the Hamishan operator. And then you integrate. But now uh, this is a reason why I renormalized. So I put one over k. So you have 1 over k here, and now this k disappears. And now you zoom on the variety. So you are going to make a change of coordinates. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you, you trivialize the coordinates, and you approximate the lin linear part. So you, you can always achieve that a, a at some point 0 is 0. So essentially you can replace by uh, 
well. Okay, it's a of x, but you can you can um, change coordinates so that at any given point uh, the connection matrix is zero. Okay, and then um, you change coordinates and you put capital X i is equal to square root of k times x i. So you zoom by this factor square root of k, and then you see that this sum becomes sum over i of du over d capital X i plus, now this is zero, so you, you divide by square root of k and then you, you obtain the derivative essentially of a prime zero. And here, because you zoom, uh, you get value of v at zero. So intuitively, uh, you, are, you are zooming, uh, so you are, you are dividing uh, the variety in small cubes, and the size, the size here of the cubes is roughly 1 over square root of k, and you are zooming and looking uh, on each small cube the behavior of the, of, of, the, of the object. And of course, everything becomes with constant coefficient, because when you zoom, uh, you, uh, I mean, the variation becomes very small. And you can, you can, of course, compute completely the spectrum of uh, the corresponding Laplace operators for constant metrics with constant curvature and, and, and constant potential or whatever. And this is completely computable. So the local asymptotics on each cube is known. And then you sum up for the cube. And you have some partition of a unity argument. But then you can estimate the growth of this. Uh, the wavelength, somehow, the wavelength of the phenomenon is 1 over square root of k. And you are, you are looking at waves such that the uh, uh, length wave is 1 over square root of k. And this is the explanation. Okay. So now, uh, It's interesting to understand a little bit better what are these functions. So, uh, first observation is that you can extend to the no well, you would like to extend to the neuron severity uh, vector space. So, you, you define the neuron severity real vector space of X to be a real subspace, real vector subspace of H11 of XR. So if you insist on uh, looking at a non keller manifold, you should not look at the ordinary uh, Hodge, uh, Hodge group, but you should look at the Butcher homology. So here you look at the D-Bot homology. But this is uh, absolutely uh, okay here because uh, the C1 of L is defined by a DD bar. So uh, the C1 of L makes sense in this enriched uh, theory. Of course, in the Keller case, it's just the usual H1. Uh, you take the real subspace, which is generated by integral classes. And integral classes of type 1, 1, of type 1, 1. My standard theorem of Vail, uh, this is the same as the chunk classes of, of polymorphic line bundles. So this is the same as uh, the vector span over real numbers of the chunk classes. Okay. And now you pick an element in this vector subspace. And now the question is, you would like to define a, a function of this. And then, uh, well, you can do this. HQ f of x alpha. You are going to take this. You are going to take the limb soup over all pairs LK in such a way that 1 over K converges to alpha. Here you have a space uh, with integer points, but of course if you take 
uh, if you extend to rationals, it becomes dense in the real vector subspace, and then you can converge to a real class. And then uh, you take the Lin's loop of the HQ of XL in these conditions. So maybe I should put LK if you. So you take sequences, sequences of line bundles in such a way that 1 over k, c1 of lk converges to alpha, and you take this limb source. It's not uh, completely clear that this uh, will coincide uh, with, the, uh, with this, but in fact it is true on a smaller subspace. In general, it would be a conjecture. So maybe I can state this as a conjecture. So the HQ, which I defined earlier, actually uh, is purely numerical and depends only on the first two class one of Of course, to prove this, you have to prove some kind of stability that uh, these groups, so it's H, I forgot the uh, n factorial over k to uh, You have to prove some stability. Uh, the, this definition is by looking only at powers. But here you look somehow at all possible rational approximations. Uh, so you have things which are nearby, nearby the multiples, and not, not just the multiples. So uh, here uh, you, of course, this, this, this definition, you have an inequality which is obvious, but the equality is not clear. But uh, it is true, at least on the subspace. So uh, the theorem, it's not very hard to prove. So I will introduce the divisible of neuron several space. So instead of, of picking uh, all line bundles, you pick only the effective divisors. So take the real span. D are effective divisors. Of course, uh, if X is projective algebraic, this is the same because uh, any uh, any line bundle has uh, um, rational sections. So, uh, the projective algebraic case is the same. So this is equal to uh, the usual Meron theory uh, in, in the projective algebraic case. In general, it might be different. Uh, then you do have equality on this smaller subspace, and in particular, the conjecture is okay for projective varieties. Then I forgot what effective divisor means. Um, this positive coefficient. Uh, a divisor with po positive coefficients. Okay. Well, actually, I don't, I don't I forget it because I take real combinations. So I can take uh, integral divisors. Then uh, equality equals true. So it means that asymptotic cohomology does not depend on, uh, on, on the, bun on the isomorph isomorphism class of the bundle, but depends only on the numeric. So it's a numerical invariant rather than a uh, uh, algebraic invariant. Maybe I should be note, I should have denoted by a different symbol. On moreover.
Uh, moreover, if you look at this map, so the asymptotic cohomology function, so now it's a map which is defined on a finite dimensional vector space. It's defined on, uh, when you look at only on the divisorial part. go into the positive real numbers. Well, this map is uh, homogeneous. And uh, locally, Lipschitz continues. So it satisfies. So homogeneity is obvious. So if you multiply by a factor, Okay, uh, well, you can approximate the uh, uh, real numbers by rational numbers. So if you raise L to a multiple, uh, then this multiple gets multiplied, gets raised to power n. So what you get is this homogeneity. And uh, now uh, you have uh, some kind of continuity. If you compare Lipschitz continuity, this will be less than a constant times norm of alpha minus beta times norm of alpha plus beta to the n minus 1. With respect to any norm, it's a finite dimensional vector space, so all norms are equivalent. So you pick any norm on this finite dimensional vector space. And then you see that the cohomology somehow behaves continuously when you vary uh, the line limits. So uh, let me give you a rough idea of how this is proved. This is not very difficult. Actually, these ideas were already considered uh, by algebraic geometers a few years ago although not in this generality. So all these concepts uh, in, in, in the algebraic case were considered by Alex Kuronia. And uh, papers also by Rob Nazisfeld, uh, Lawrence Ein, Nixeram Kustatza, so alpha and beta are in the cohomology. So uh, here, this property is uh, in this uh, in there. In there. What does this norm this norm mean? You are here on a finite dimensional vector space. So you pick any norm, and then of course the constant will become the choice of the norm. Oh, the constant. Yeah, that is the constant. So the idea is quite simple, actually. Um, so suppose you have two uh, line bundles which differ by a small amount. If they differ by a small amount, it means that they differ by a small Q divisor. So it's an epsilon d. It's a small small Q divisor. Well, if you are, I, I use only one, but if you are in a finite dimensional vector space, uh, they would be generated by some basis, D1 capital N, and then you would take a linear combination of several members. Uh, let me take only one simplified notation. Uh, actually, it would be uh, some kind of, you would generate everything uh, as a class by taking uh, small sums to the basis. Okay, and then you raise to some multiple. Of course, you are going to take a multiple so that you eliminate denominators. You want to say the line bundles themselves, or that there are some multiples of their turn classes that provide something small? Since you're looking at. Well, actually, you take a Q. Uh, mm, you, I mean. You are going to uh, to prove continuity. 
uh, a, a function which is defined over a dense subset extends if it's uniform and continuous. Right. It's, you're starting with integer classes. Elemental prime, of course, are integer classes rather than natural. So I just wanted to say. So I'm, I'm going to take rational classes. Yes. Uh, you, you're going to prove this on the rational classes and prove this inequality, and then uh, you prove that it is uniformly continuous, and therefore you have a, a, a continuous extension to the real classes. So L and L prime are actually groups of lines on the So uh, in this proof, uh, you should think uh, of L and L prime as Q-line bundles, uh, differing by a small Q divider. Okay? But then, since anyway you, you, you compute asymptotic cohomology, you are ready to take large multiples, and therefore you don't care if they are uh, Q-line bundles, because you can take a power which is a, an integral. So after you raise to a power, you can assume that these are integral mind uh, bundle divisors. And then you can, of course, uh, take the positive part and the negative part. And, and then by comparing, uh, you can assume that the divisor is either positive or negative. Assume it's, say, negative. They consider the negative case. D now is positive. But then, of course, uh, you have an exact sequence. And here you look at the restriction of L to the K to some, to some subscheme which is the subscheme defined by the quotient of Ox by Ox of minus k epsilon d. And then you want, this is the L prime. And you want to compare cohomology of this and cohomology of this. So by the exact sequence, you have to look at those groups. But now those groups, they live in the support of a scheme in, the, in a scheme which is supported on D, so it's a, a dimension one less. So you still have to compute the multiplicities, but essentially by uh, induction dimension, uh, the cohomology that comes from the term on the right is small. Because the epsilon is small, and therefore the multiplicities of, of the scheme are small, and then you control by Hemenroth. Uh, so you have a dimension which gives you k to the n minus one, and then you multiply by multiplicity which is epsilon k. So you have epsilon k to the n, by Heyman Hall, and therefore you have shown the continuity. So uh, the continuity comes from this. So that, that doesn't give you a uniform constant, does it? Sorry? Does that give you one constant for every a uniform constant? Uh, the, the, the constant, uh, to, to have a uniform constant, you, you have to work a little bit more. Uh, but it comes from the fact that uh, you are in a finite dimensional vector space. So all your devices can be generated by a finite family of divisors, and then you have to control uniformity for all these devices. It's not, not very common. OK, so now uh, that we understand a little bit more uh, the asymptotic cohomology, Uh, one would like to relate uh, the asymptotic cohomology to the Morse intervals. And now, let us make a bold conjecture. Maybe optimistic. That uh, the asymptotic cohomology of any holomorphic line bundle is actually obtained by uh, the infimum of the Morse intervals. So you take all possible smooth metrics and then you compute the Morse Interval with respect to the curvature of that metric and take the infimum of all, you know that this is this by the, the, the more senior qualities. And you expect that this is optimal, and namely that if you take the infimum of all smooth metrics and L, 
then you will get equality. And the same, the same for the alternate sums. So if you take the rim soup of the alternate sums, then this will be the infinitum over all smooth metrics. Here you take uh, the integral over uh, open sets which are index 0, 1, up to q. And in the package of the conjecture also you add that all limb soups are limits. In, uh, in the real case, you would expect perfect mass function. Perfect mass function that um, realize the homology. Here you have some hope uh, that you take an infinite of a continuous set. Uh, as uh, we will check very soon, uh, actually both sides are, for instance, birational invariants, binomorphic invariants. So you can you can allow blow-ups in such things, and uh, it still works. And uh, you can also allow uh, things which are negligible. So this is what maybe is missing in the real case, is that you, you, you have a continuous problem. Uh, a discrete problem is harder. So maybe a uh, conjecture could be true. So this will be my next observation. So, of course, uh, the asymptotic homology here is a bimeromorphic invariant. So, if you have uh, two Manifolds, and then you, you perform a sequence of blow so you have a modification. And then you start with a line bundle here, and then you take the pullback. Then uh, the asymptotic homology of this and the asymptotic homology of L are equal. The reason is that you can uh, use the Leroy spectral sequence, so you are computing. Uh, Uh, the uh, direct images uh, of the Leroy spectral sequence, but all this is supported in the exceptional set. Uh, because the exceptional set is of dimension one, the growth of, of the powers uh, occurs in dimension one less. So what, what happens on, on the exceptional locus uh, counts at most for, for k to the n minus one because this is cohomology of, of a line bundle on something which is of lower dimension. So for this reason, you're, you're counting volumes. So you could, you could, analytically, you could think of that as saying that, well, you, you modify the curvature on the set of measure zero, so you don't modify the intervals. You are counting volumes, there are intervals. So if you, if you blow up the manifold, you don't change the global volume. Okay. So this is a binomorphic invariant. Uh, it's a slightly more subtle argument to show that the, uh, the Morse intervals are also binomorphically invariant. The infinite. I, I don't write for the, for the second case, but it's also true.
course, in the real case, it's not as, as well behaved because if you blow up, you suddenly modify the Betty number. You are counting something which is not as stable as the volumes. Uh, the reason is that, well, in one direction, it's clear. If you have a metric here, which is smooth, you can uh, take a pullback and then you get the smooth metric upstairs. So you have more metric more metrics upstairs than you have downstairs. So certainly uh, the infimum can only decrease when you blow up. And in the other direction, if you start from a metric here, of course it's a metric uh, of a bundle which is trivial on the exceptional divisors. Well, if, if you blow up the points. Um, so what you want to do is to push forward the metric. But of course, if you do this, uh, you don't get a smooth metric. You get a metric which should be viewed as a singular metric downstairs. So you have to regularize this metric. And it turns out that by elementary techniques of Perissi-Bromley functions, uh, so somehow on the exceptional divisor, the metric may vary. So you have a, a metric which is widely behaved uh, on the points uh, which you blow. But then, in those points, you, you patch the metric which is something that you know already which is smooth. Right? You take a, a supremum. So you cut the metric here. So you, you modify the metric on a very small set. And because you integrate anyway, you can make this difference very small. So it's a regularization technique. It's not very hard. If you have two metrics, H1, which is given in terms of a fixed metric by some weight, P1, and H2, which is given by a weight, P2, the standard way of patching cloister functions is to replace by max of P1, P2. So if you have a function which is badly behaved somewhere, so you have a function which oscillates a lot, and then you have another one which is smooth, you are going to add some pole here to make the one which is badly behaved smaller than the one which is uh, well behaved. And then when you take the maximum, uh, this bad behavior has been pushed down to minus infinity, and when you take the max, you, you kill it. So it's a standard procedure for Plurisimum. Uh, they are not, they are only quasi close to Just matter of thinking. Okay, and now I can state the uh, two theorems. So theorem one, uh, the conjecture, the optimistic conjecture, is okay for Q equals zero. So in that case, it's called the volume. So the volume of a line bundle is just the growth, the asymptote growth of, of the section. So it's just H at zero. Of XL, and this is indeed equal to the infimum over all smooth metrics of the most sums on the index zero set. And theorem two. Uh, the full conjecture is okay in small dimensions. So, of course, in dimension 1, well, in dimension 1, uh, any line bundle can be uh, 
taken to be a constant curvature. Okay, so, it's a, you saw the Laplace equation. So it's given, the, the first term class is just a number on the curve. Uh, and then um, making the curvature constant is just a matter of solving a linear Laplace operator. So any line bundle on the curve can be taken to have constant curvature with respect to any given uh, Riemannian metric. Emission uh, and therefore everything is trivial for curves. But for surfaces, it's not trivial. That's still true. So, uh, conjecture, optimistic conjecture is true for dimension. Yes, uh, so uh, let me, well, I probably will not have much time to explain more details. Uh, the talk is supposed to be in one hour, I guess, so I mean, two minutes. Okay. Uh, first, um, of course, you have said already. Namely, that h hat q of xl is the same as h hat n minus q of x l minus 1. With the duality of kx, but since you raise to multiples, uh, the kx is negligible with respect to large multiples. Uh, well, it's, it's made, it may be true only in the protective case. Do I forgot an X protective surface? And here, uh, X protective as well. I, can, I cannot prove it at all. Yeah, but it would also be not L minus 1, but L minus 1 tends to come out of the line box. No, no, no. It's K no, because uh, oh, it's asymptotic. Oh, I see. So it's it's asymptotic okay. homology, so you, you don't care about the constants. Uh, uh, but because I, I'm claiming that uh, the, the theorem is only in the protective case, uh, the canonical is always divisible. Uh, it will not be true that on the general compact compact manifold. You, you don't know that the canonical is divisible. But because you assume it's projective, the canonical is divisible. That's what it is. You, you still need this uh, tricky statement. Okay. And then, of course, if you replace L by N minus 1, it means that you, uh, it's, you just change signs in the curvature. And therefore, uh, the Q index set becomes the N minus Q index set uh, when you reverse. So uh, the intervals are reversed as well. And therefore, uh, the theorem is also true for Q equal dimension. So this means that in the surface case, uh, you are in good shape because you know for zero by CR duality, you know for two, and then uh, you have Riemann R, which gives delta and sum of the, of the three terms. So you, you still have control on H1. So this is why uh, somehow you only have to prove theorem one. You can prove theorem one, then you will easily be used for services. But now it's still a challenge to prove uh, for the volume. So unfortunately, I think I will not have much time except to say uh, some advertisement for another work. Uh, so in that case, um, you have to prove it only when the volume is strictly positive. If the volume is zero, well, you make a different argument. So assume that the volume is strictly positive. It means that the bundle is big. But big means that after you perform a blow-up, you have that almost a, you have approximate Zariski decomposition. So you can decompose the big part into ample plus uh, exceptional part. 
because you are invariant by, by modification, you are somehow reduced to proving the ample case. And in the ample case, it's not that difficult. Uh, and then we have to understand uh, the, 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 somehow the interplay between the ample part and the exceptional part. And this interplay, um, well, I prove it's not easy, but it's solved by a, a paper I wrote with Fuxon uh, de Carnet on a, uh, the structure of the positive code. So you have to know something about the geometry of, of the code positive uh, divisors and arbitrary uh, protective varieties. Uh, using this, you have enough information on the connection between the angle part and the, uh, and the fixed part of, of, of the human model to understand uh, what is the business. So this is roughly the question. So I'm already over time. So Should be located in the proper enterprise. So the, the, the locus of entire curves, the, the entire curves cannot be that uh, dense in varieties of genome. Um, uh, to prove this, now uh, you have to produce a lot of uh, differential equations. Uh, you can produce differential equations by counting uh, rows of, of, of sections. Uh, at this point, this can be only done by most. There 
there's some kind of probabilistic uh, computation that requires more symbolic. So I cannot do it. So I, I will try to show you how one uses this estimate. Unlikely that the entire dimension will be able to, to solve. 